Soon after he had opened enlightenment, he heard of the existence of the Suragama Sutra, and he proceeded to face the West every day and bow to the Suragama Sutra, hoping to be able to read it. But although he bowed for eighteen years, he never did see it. Wouldn't you say that was regrettable? The practices which the virtuous patriarchs of China followed in displaying their respect for the Buddha Dharma show how extremely reverent they were. Some people bow to the Dharma Flower Sutra and the Suragama Sutra. They bow once for every word, bowing all day long from morning to night. Some have become enlightened while bowing to a sutra. Thus, there are all kinds of different methods of cultivation. No matter which method you cultivate, all you have to do is to do it single-mindedly. Don't cultivate on the one hand and strike up false thoughts on the other. For instance, I know there are some people here listening to the sutra who are not really listening. They are thinking, after a while I'm going to telephone my girlfriend. Or how am I going to answer that letter I got? With their attention focused on these kinds of questions, how can they expect to have any response as far as the Buddha Dharma is concerned? But they still haven't awakened. They don't say, Ah, now I'm study, studying the Buddha Dharma and I should put everything down and concentrate my attention on studying the Buddha Dharma. So in the end, they have no idea what I have been explaining and sometimes if they become aware of it, they say it is meaningless. That's the kind of fault they have. Sutra, what do you think? Are these flavors produced from emptiness? Do they come forth from the tongue or are they produced from the food? Commentary Ananda, what is your opinion about the flavors of these curds, buttermilk, and clarified butter which you say are supreme? What do you think? Are these flavors produced from emptiness? Does emptiness bring forth these defining objects of flavors? Do they come forth from the tongue? Are these defining objects of flavor produced from the organ of your tongue? Or are they produced from the food? Or is it that the defining objects of flavor arise from the things eaten? Sutra, again, Ananda, suppose that the flavors came from your tongue. Now there is only one tongue in your mouth. When that tongue had already become the flavors of curds, then it would not change if it encountered some dark rock candy. Commentary, again, Ananda, what did you say this flavor is produced from is it produced from emptiness is it produced from the tongue or is it produced from the food tell me suppose that the flavors that came from your tongue you may say the organ of your tongue produces this flavor then when you eat something say curds for example the tongue would become the flavor of curds now there is only that one tongue in your mouth when that tongue had already become the flavor of curds, then it would not change if it encounters some dark rope candy. Dark rope candy is made out of sugar cane and it is as hard as a rock. It was probably an ancient method for making candy that created it. Your tongue has already changed to the flavor of curds, so when you eat candy, it will not be sweet. Why? You only have one tongue and so it will have only one flavor you cannot change one tongue into so many flavors sutra suppose it did not change that would not be what is called knowing tests suppose it did change the tongue is not many substances and how could one tongue know so many tests commentary suppose it did not change if when you ate dark rock candy it did not change to sweet, that would not be what is called knowing tastes. Then your tongue would not be functioning as an organ that recognizes tastes. Suppose it did change. Suppose that when you ate curse, for instance, there was a, the flavor of curse, and 
when you ate the candy, the flavor changed to sweet. Now, the tongue is not many substances. There is only one tongue organ. And how could one tongue know so many tastes if flavors came from your, your own tongue? How could you recognize so many flavors? And yet you can, so this argument doesn't hold. So try, suppose it were produced from the food. The food does not have a consciousness. How could it know tastes? Moreover, if the food itself were to recognize them, that would be the same as someone else eating. Then what connection would that have with what is called your recognition of tastes? Commentary. Suppose it were produced from the food. Suppose the flavor arose in the food. The food does not have consciousness. Eatable things are devoid of awareness. They haven't any consciousness. How could it know taste? Since food hasn't any awareness, any consciousness, how could it know taste? Moreover, if the food itself were to recognize them, if it were the edible things that knew their own flavor, that would be the same as someone else eating. That would be the same as if it ate its own flavor. Then what connection would that have with what is called your recognition of taste? How could that be called knowing the flavor of what one eats? Sutra, suppose it were produced in emptiness. When you eat emptiness, what flavor does it have? Suppose that emptiness had the flavor of salt. Then, since your tongue was salty, your face would also be salty, and likewise, everyone in the world would be like fish in the sea, since you would be constantly influenced by salt. You would never know tastelessness. If you did not recognize tastelessness, you would not be aware of the saltiness either. You would not know anything at all. How could that be what is called taste? Commentary. Suppose it were produced in emptiness. Perhaps you want to say that flavors are produced in emptiness. When you eat emptiness, what flavor does it have? Tasting. Take a bite of emptiness and see what it tastes like. Suppose that emptiness had the flavor of salt. Say, for example, that emptiness tasted like salt. Then, since your tongue was salty, since your tongue was turned salty by the salty flavor, your face would also be salty, and likewise, everyone in the world would be like a fish in the sea. In flavor arose, if flavor arose in emptiness, it wouldn't just be your tongue that it imparted its flavor to. If it made your tongue salty, it would also make your face salty. Your body too would be salty and so would everyone else. If everyone's body was salty, then the people of this world would become like fish in the sea. They would all take on the flavor of salt. Since you would be constantly influenced by salt, you should realize that if you were constantly soaked and drowned in saltiness, you would never know tastelessness. You wouldn't know what was meant by tastelessness. If you did not recognize tastelessness, you would not be aware of the saltiness either. Why not? If you were not aware of tastelessness, you wouldn't know about flavors, and since you wouldn't know flavors, you wouldn't be aware of sound. You would not know anything at all. You basically wouldn't recognize any flavor at all. How could that be what is called taste? Then, why would you come up with a name and call it the defining object of taste? Sutra. Therefore, you should know that neither flavors nor the tongue's tasting has a location, and so the two places of tasting and flavor are empty and false. Their origin is not in causes and conditions, nor do their natures arise spontaneously. Commentary. Therefore, you should know that neither flavors nor the tongue's tasting has a location. They have no fixed place. And so the two places of tasting and flavor are empty and false. Tasting and flavor 
just to speak of these two places are emptily and falsely produced and emptily and falsely extinguished. Their origin is not in causes and conditions. They are not created from causes and conditions, nor do they need to their natures arise spontaneously, nor are they created from spontaneity. They are a representation of the wonderful nature of true suchness of the first commons treasury and nothing more. Sutra Ananda Early every morning you rub your head with your hand. Commentary Buddhist monks are supposed to rub their heads three times every morning to see if they have any hair. If not, why not? Oh, they are monks. They are people who have left the home life. This practice was adopted because when Shakyamuni Buddha was in the world, the adherents of a lot of externalist sects took refuge with the Buddha. Afterward, the Buddha taught the monks to rub their own heads three times every day in order to help them remember that they were monks. Ananda was very attentive to the teachings, and so he faithfully put this instruction into practice every day at daybreak without fail. Ananda, early every morning you rub your head with your hand. You rub your monk's head with your hand in order to help you remember why you haven't any hair. It is done to teach people not to forget what they are all about. The Buddha asked Ananda about it in order to begin his explanation of the two places of the body and the defiling objects of touch, the ninth and tenth of the twelve places. Sutra What do you think? When there is a sensation of the rubbing, where does the ability to make contact lie? Is the ability in the hands or is it in the head? Commentary Where does the sensation of contact lie? And I'm asking you a question. When you rub your head, a sensation of contact arises. What do you think? When there is a sensation of rubbing, when where does the ability to make contact lie? Your hand is aware of the rubbing, and so is your head, which is the one that is able to do the touching, which is the one that is touched. Is the ability in the hands or is it in the head? Does the ability to make contact lie in the hands or in the head? Speak up. Sutra, if it were in the hands, then the head would have no knowledge of it, and how could that be what is called touch? If it were in the head, then the hands would be useless, and how could that be what is called touch? Commentary, if it were in the hands, then the head would have no knowledge of it. If you say the touch lies in the hands, then the head would not know when you rubbed it. And how could that be what is called touch? If the head does not know, it cannot be a case of touch. If it were in the head, then the hands would be useless. If you say the power of touch lies in your head, then your hands would not be aware of any sensation. And how could that be what is called touch? And and that you explain it for me. When the monks rub their heads three times, they recite a very meaningful verse which I will recite for you. Guard your mouth, collect your mind, and do not commit transgressions with your body. Do not bother any sentient being. Stay far away from non-beneficial ascetic practices. One who cultivates like this can save the world. Guard your mouth means do not just say whatever you feel like. Collect your mind means keep your thoughts from wandering about. Don't engage in false thinking, don't continually seek advantage from circumstances, and do not commit transgressions with your body. Make sure you don't commit offenses with your body. When the mouth is guarded, it is free of the four evils. It does not engage in abusive language, in lying, in profanity, or in gossip. With a collected mind, one has no greed, hatred, 
and stupidity. When no transgressions are committed with the body, one does not engage in killing, stealing, or sexual misconduct. Even thinking of such things is not permissible. Do not bother any sentient being. Don't cause any person or any living being whatever that you come in contact with to give rise to affliction. Don't give living beings trouble. Even less should you bother the people you are cultivating with. Sometimes you intentionally make a mistake and cause people else to be upset. In such a case, you should find an opportunity to explain yourself and not just let the problem escalate. Stay far away from non-beneficial aesthetic practices. These are bitter practices which are of no benefit, such as the, the way some people in India imitate the behavior of cows and dogs, sleep on beds of nails and row in ashes to cover his bodies with filth. What meaning is there in such practices? What it is that in cultivating the way the filthier you are, the dirtier your mind is. When the outside gets dirty and you are always thinking about the filth, your mind is also filthy. These are what are called non-beneficial ascetic practices. Do not engage in them. You should do things which are of benefit to people. Do not do things which are of no benefit to people. Stay far away from beneficial ascetic practices. One who cultivates like this can save the world. Like this means that you do not bother and misunderstand me. Do not engage in non-beneficial ascetic practices and do not practice in dramas of externalist sects. What is meant by the dramas of externalist sects? Shakyamuni Buddha practiced the middle way according to his method of cultivation. He taught his disciples to eat vegetarian food, no, not to eat meat, or if they eat meat, to eat the three kinds of pure meat. One, what I did not see killed, I did not see the animal killed. So what I did not hear killed, you did not hear the sounds of the laughter. Three, what was I, what was not killed for me? The pig and cow sheep was not killed especially for me. According to the Buddha's teaching, it is permissible to eat these three, three, three kinds of pure meat if, every, uh, if one's body is not strong. Thus, the Buddha taught his disciples to eat vegetarian food and what did you, so you suppose that Devadatta did? With his devin knowledge and devin views, he thought, hmm, you teach your disciples to eat vegetarian food, do you? I teach my disciples not to eat salt, they don't even eat salt. This practice also exists in Taoism, is referred to as a superior pure vegetarianism. Actually, it is not in accord with the middle way, but that's the way Devadatta did it. The Buddha taught his disciples to not eat after noon. In the morning, they ate rice, guru, and at noon, they had a full meal. Every day, they ate twice. Along the Buddha himself ate only once a day at noon. He did not eat in the morning and he did not eat at night. How did Devadatta teach his disciples to do? He taught them to fast for a hundred years. What do you, once? Do you eat once a day? I eat once every hundred days. See how much higher I am than you. You eat vegetarian food and I don't even eat salt. I'm always a bit higher than you.